people don't know that uh, when we invented the cell phone uh, back in uh, 1972, 1973, there was no internet, there were no personal computers, uh, there were no digital cameras, so we never imagined uh, that uh, you would have a supercomputer in every person's pocket. This was such a great interview. It's going to be a great podcast because we're shining a light on cell phones. I know you have one close to you, and if it's not already in your hand, we use them every single day. But how much do you really know about the smartphone? Where did it come from? And in this Kim Commando Explains podcast, we're going to share tons of secrets that I bet you never even knew about. It's no exaggeration to say that cell phones have totally changed the world. I mean, once upon a time, phones were these clunky gadgets that no one ever thought of as portable. It took a long time before anyone was really able to get the technology right. And that's why I was super excited to bring you today's episode. We're talking to the man behind the magic known as the father of the cell phone. His name is Marty Cooper, and he and his team at Motorola invented this truly revolutionary tech. And I mean revolutionary. It's the perfect word. I really can't think of another word that describes the way cell phones have changed our lives. Because when you think about it, before they hit the market, you couldn't make too many business calls while you were walking around. You couldn't care for your child and work at the same time. You couldn't keep track of your teens wherever they were driving around the city, which, and now that I think about it, I'm really glad that we didn't have that technology when I was a teenager. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I remember like jumping in the car when my parents were out of town, driving down the shore, well, yeah, I was from New Jersey, driving to the beach and then putting the car back in the garage, never giving a thought to, by the way, um, when my father asked, why are there so many miles on the car? Hmm, sorry, Dad. Okay, nowadays we have apps like Life360. They let us know wherever our family members are located thanks to GPS tracking. Well, back in the old days, we didn't have any of that. Well, now with today's smartphones, we can multitask and stay close to our loved ones. They've also totally changed the way that we interact. More spontaneous when making plans. Your friend is just a phone call away. My mother, 82 years old, she texts me like eight or nine times a day. You can keep appointments by calling and letting people know you'll be late. Back in the old days, if you were late, well, you were just out of luck. And then there are the physical changes. Have you ever heard of the smartphone pinky? Yeah, it's a new smartphone-related condition that went viral last year. And there's been a controversy about whether or not it's even real or if it's just fake news. But if you glance down at your hands, is your pinky bent or is it indented in an abnormal way due to the way and how much you're holding your smartphone. Maybe you have smartphone pinky. But the bottom line is this. Phones have impacted our lives in countless incredible ways. So in this podcast, we're going to take a look at the past and share the story that changed the world. You're going to love this. Marty Cooper is going to tell us how cell phones were invented and also what he thinks the future may hold. There are a ton of fun stories in this. I have to tell you, Mike James and I were talking about this podcast after we did the interview, and we both agree that this may be the best interview we've ever done. So hold the phone and stay on the line. We'll be right back. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you're known as the father of the modern cell phone. Way back when, could you ever imagine anything like the iPhone? Not really. I, I, people don't know that uh, when we invented the cell phone uh, back in uh, 1972, 1973, there was no Internet. There were no personal computers. Uh, there were no digital cameras. So we never imagined uh, that uh, you would have a supercomputer in, in every person's pocket. But on the other hand, we did believe that someday everybody would have a phone. We said that someday when you were born, you'd be assigned a phone number. And if you didn't answer the phone, you had died. <laughs> which is which is pretty much par for the cars right now. Um, now, the back in the early 70s, say, the whole idea was for you to have a car phone, right? Yeah. And even the car phones, they were, they were, the service was so bad that during the busy hour, uh, uh, the chances of getting a line were like one in twenty. So, so uh, 
personal communications was really limited to pagers. Remember, you remember what a pager was? <laughs> yeah, I do. And, you know, as a matter of fact, um, I have some friends who work at the Mayo Clinic, and they still wear pagers. They still do today. The doctors do. Sure. Because it's a way for you to get an instant message, no matter where you are, through the walls and steel and what have you. But what's interesting is that you were working for Motorola at the time, and your big competitor was, of course, AT&T. And tell us the story, because I think it's fascinating, about how AT&T, they were trying to grab basically all the, the, the entire spectrum, right? They wanted to be a monopoly. They were a monopoly. They were the biggest company in the world. And, and if you wanted to get a telephone, you couldn't even uh, buy the phone. You had to rent it from the Bell system. So uh, your, your listeners should know that we're not talking about the modern AT&T. This is a very different company. But they were the biggest company in the world, and they wanted to perpetuate their monopoly. What you just said is exactly right. And then Motorola came in and said, wait, what, what about us? And so you, at that time, Motorola petitioned the FCC. Is that correct? Well, that's right. The FCC was the decision maker. They're the ones that decide who can talk on any radio channel. And uh, and they were about to actually uh, accede to the uh, Bell System uh, request. You know, Bell System had, uh, they had 200 lobbyists calling on the FCC. Wow. We had one guy. Uh, so uh, the, FCC, the FCC was about to grant this, and we came in and explained to them, first of all, that uh, monopolies are not good and it was necessary to have one. And second of all, that the uh, this idea of, of locking people in their cars if they wanted to communicate, you know, for 100 years we'd had those uh, copper wires, and now they're going to say we're going to be restricted to your car. So it, it just didn't make sense to us. So we uh, went into the FCC and told them there was another alternative. Uh, and uh, it took 10 years for them to actually make up their minds. <laughs> but uh, but we won finally. 10 years. Wow. That's a long time in product development. That's a extraordinary sure long time. So so you wanted to create the the mobile cellular phone. And you started testing this in, what, 1972, is that right? Yeah, well, actually, uh, the uh, the idea we started to work on when Bell announced their intention, it was 1969, and uh, at the end of 1972, it looked like the FCC was getting ready to make a decision, and we were really scared. We were paranoid. And that's when the idea came to me that, you know, we're not going to persuade anybody unless we give them the experience. Let them find out what the freedom is of being able to make a phone call wherever you are. Uh, it, it is, is a, really a new form of freedom that people had never experienced. So that's when I decided we were going to build one. We were going to make a handheld portable telephone that you could use anywhere in any place. How many, how many different parts were in that first phone because we didn't have like solid state technology like we have now. It was a, a hand belt built marvel, Kim. Uh, you know, a modern phone with a supercomputer and all that capability has about 115 parts of it. Uh, our phone had about 500, and all it could do was talk and listen. <laughs> no, no, no computer, no camera. Uh, no uh, uh, texting, so, but uh, it was a marvel that they managed to pack all that stuff in. The battery, well, I, 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 I guess your listeners have all seen what that phone looked like. It was about uh, 10 inches high, an uh, inch and a half wide, and about four inches deep. Uh, most of it was, uh, or a good part of it was battery. Uh, we it was the batteries were nickel cadmium, if you remember those days, uh, and the phone weighed uh, over two pounds. <laughs> I was just going to ask you how much it weighed. <laughs> yeah, the battery life uh, of this phone was less than a half hour of talking. <laughs> it turns out that wasn't it wasn't a problem, Kim. 
because you couldn't carry that for, uh, phone up, up to your ear for 25 minutes. It was so heavy. It's kind of like. But it works. It's kind of like you remember that first compact computer, the Luggable? I mean, it was in 1983, it was like 25 pounds. I had one of those. And I remember carrying that around going, this is sweet. And, and me, but meanwhile, you know, I weigh like 100 pounds. <laughs> it was like, this is crazy yeah. stuff. All right. So take us to the day, April 3rd, 1973. And you were in Manhattan, right? Right. I was at the Hilton Hotel on 6th Avenue in Manhattan. And you wanted to demonstrate the system? You were having like a press conference, is that right? Well, we had a press conference in the afternoon. Uh, our PR people were working like mad, trying to get people like you to to uh, publicize this thing. And I was supposed to be on a network TV program. We got bumped. <laughs> so they found a, uh, a radio reporter. Uh, and uh, so I said, look, as long as we're doing that, let's do that out of the tree- street. So that uh, this guy can get the feeling of what it's like to be outside and free. And so we met in front of the uh, Hilton on 6th Avenue in in New York. Uh, And and that's where I made that uh, very first public call. And the call was to, I love this, basically your rival at AT AT&T, right? Joel Engel? That's exactly right. It was it was serendipitous because uh, all we were worried up up to that point is uh, could we actually get this thing working? And uh, the guys were with well, the night before we're still fixing the phone oh, at, no. at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so uh, so at the last minute, I, I was uh, told them, "Well, I'm going to make a call." And I thought, "Should I call my wife? Should I call it uh, boss?" And I it occurred to me to call Joel Engel, and I took my little uh, address book out. You remember that? Well, you're too young for that to, to know when you had to carry your, your phone numbers and your addresses in a, in a paper, a uh, little paper book. Uh, and I dialed uh, Joel's number, and miraculously, he answered. Not his <laughs> secretary, but himself. So, and I said, uh, "Hi, Joel. It's it's Marty Cooper." He says, "Hi, Marty." I could see, I could sense the suspicion in his voice. I said, Joel, I'm calling you on a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone. Silence on the other end of the line. I, I'm sure he was gritting his teeth. <laughs> to, to this day, uh, Joel, he doesn't dispute that, it, that we made that call, but he doesn't remember it. And, Kim, I guess I don't, don't blame him. <laughs> I mean, what a, I mean, what a piece of history. I mean, the guy answered the phone, right, Marty? I mean, it was just perfect. It was like as if you had set this up. Yeah, ex- exactly. And that wasn't the only momentous thing that happened because I'm chatting away, talking to this reporter, and I step off the curb, and he grabs me and pulls me back. And that was the first time that somebody almost got killed uh, by uh, being distracted by a cell phone. (laughs) As you know, that happens like a million times a day now. Yeah, unfortunately. You know, we are all looking down instead of looking up and people run into things. They they get hurt. They do get killed, and especially in major cities like that. Uh, Marty, we're going to take a quick break to say thank you to a few sponsors. Uh, they help make these podcasts possible. And when we come right back, folks, you want to stay right where we are because we're we'll talking to Marty more about cutting the cord, how the cell phone has transformed humanity. It's, he just wrote a brand new book. So stay right where you are. Hey, welcome back to Kim Commando Explains. We are having such a great conversation with Marty Cooper. He's known as the father of the modern cell phone, and he has a new book out, Cutting the Cord. The cell phone has transformed humanity. And so when you made that phone call, what happened after the call? Did did suddenly people start taking notice like, hey, this is really something? It's just not a fad? Well, not really. <laughs> it, it, uh, I have to tell you that the people on the streets of New York were amazed because, uh, as I told you before, these uh, were primitive times. There were no cordless phones. 
uh, as well as all the other things that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, the FCC didn't make up their minds, uh, and the technology really wasn't ready for over 10 years. The first commercial phones, phones that you could actually buy, didn't happen in, until uh, 1983, mm-hmm. 10, years, 10 years later. And even then, uh, a, a car, the, the first phones were both car phones and portables. Uh, a car phone cost $3,000 in 1973 dollars, and a portable is 4000 which would today would be way over $10,000 for a phone. And the, and the phones didn't work very well because they had to build all these cell sites, and that took time. So you know, the cell phone did really become a widely used phenomenon until the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. You know, I just want to go back for just a second, Marty. How did you guys come up with the design? It's called a shoe design, is that right, for that first phone? It it did look a little bit like a a high heel shoe. Uh, And uh, it was because we had... uh, First of all, I, I ought to mention, Kim, that the idea of the cell phone didn't happen out of thin air. And that's one of the points that I tried to make in my book, that uh, we had created a culture at Motorola where we knew that uh, people could, could be so much more productive if they could be in communication all the time. Mm-hmm. So we were making uh, these portable phones uh, even in the uh, mid-'60s for uh, policemen, uh, for fire departments, uh, for uh, any business that had resources on the move. So that's where we got the, the real feeling uh, that that the freedom of cell phones was really the way to go and that the car phone was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was. I'm going to get in my car to make a phone call. <laughs> okay. <It's> like, okay. <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the Bell System did a study with McKinsey, very famous consulting organization, and McKinsey concluded that the maximum number of phones that there would be in the whole world ever would be uh, something like a million. And <laughs> and uh, as you know, uh, there are more phones in the world today than there are people, more phones in the United States than there are people. But McKinsey was right. The maximum number of car phones that ever existed <laughs> in the world was, was less than a million. <laughs> that would be it. I, you know, I remember uh, my parents had one, and, you know, it was a big deal then. I mean, that was really something extraordinary, being able to do that. But, you know, as as I told you, my mom worked for Bell Labs, and so, you know, I've been around technology, you know, since the 70s when she would bring home a terminal which I'm sure you remember, they were like a suitcase. And then yep. you would take the phone and you'd hook it up to it. It was acoustic coupler. And she would get work done. And then I would play this game called Hunt the Wumpus um, that was really developed to, to port between one system, one Unix box to another Unix box. And, and, and just a really interesting times to think about that. For those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, when you played a video game at that time, it would draw a line by line <laughs> then, <Yep. laughs> for you to see the screen. And you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Um, Marty, I read somewhere that you pair the invention of the cell phone to the invention of the wheel. Um, pretty bold statement. I don't disagree with you. Uh, how do you substantiate that? Well, uh, first of all, that, that's a very self-serving comment, and, uh, and I'm not dissing the wheel <laughs> because we really need wheels <laughs> to keep the world going. But uh, I, there's no invention that has ever affected as many people as a cell phone in so short a time. When you when you think about the fact, you know, we, we don't really understand. Uh, in developed countries like the U.S. and in Europe, that the biggest impact of the cell phone is on people in Africa and in India, uh, in Mexico, uh, where people are moved out of their poverty because they now have ways of 
of uh, moving money. Mm-hmm. Sounds kind of ridiculous. Yeah, but uh, in, in Africa, there's a, a concept called m pesa that allows people to uh, save money to move it from one place to another. Uh, children can send money to their parents in the city. That alone has moved a billion people out of poverty in Africa. Wow. So, so when you think about the impact the cell phone has had in so many ways in in healthcare and just the idea of people begin to, to collaborate, to have ideas together. Uh, uh, I don't think there's been an invention that has affect, affected that many people so quickly. Well, it certainly has changed society in a lot of positive ways, if, as you so astutely mentioned, and but also obviously negative ways. Um, there's always pros and cons of everything, but obviously the invention of the phone, cell phone, the portab- portability of it. And, and you know, I am always astounded by the amount of features and technology that's built into a standard smartphone. I, I look at it and I think of everything that it does now. It's a GPS, has accelerometer built in. It can detect whether or not you're having any type of heart ailments. Um, you're certainly right about the technology, but the real issue is is what it does for people, right? Right. Uh, and 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 it, we've only started. We, we're still in the early days. Uh, we, we there are so many aspects of human behavior that are going to change over the next uh, twenty, thirty, forty years because of the cell phone is around because we can communicate. Uh, ed, the, education is going to be revolutionized. Uh, Health care, there are people, as I mentioned before, in villages in Mexico, even today, that are having their eyes examined, that are having uh, pregnant women having ultrasounds right. using the cell phone and having a doctor in Mexico City actually do the treatment. People that have never had uh, that kind of service before. Uh, and and the same thing is, is uh, true uh, in education. Uh, the pandemic has accelerated that because people are finding out that you can be educated full-time. Wherever you are, a a child that has uh, access to the Internet has access to all the information in the world uh, and can be taught uh, irrespective of where they are and what time it is. That's really important. The idea of of the, the only time you learn is a few hours you're in school uh, that's another ludicrous uh, idea. People learn all the time. You and I are learning as we speak. Right. So uh, I think education is going to get uh, revolutionized, and society as a whole is going to be more efficient. And cell phone is the lubricant of collaboration. It makes the machine of society run more smoothly. When you're talking about how school is changing, is that my son goes to USC. And, uh, and, you know, they, they, they called and they asked for a donation and I'm like a donation. I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but this is like $83,000 a year and he's taking classes on his phone. I mean, it's like, (laughs) what's going on with that? Listen, when we come right back, we're going to talk more about where you see the future of phones going with AI and And I'm going to tell you my opinion about apps, and I'm going to see if you agree. So, folks, stay right where you are. We have to say a few thank yous to some sponsors who helped make this podcast possible. Welcome back to Kim Commando Explains. We're having a wonderful, enlightening conversation with Marty Cooper. Just just a fabulous gentleman. He is the father of the modern cell phone. He has a brand new book out. I can't wait to read it myself. Cutting the Cord, The Cell Phone Has Transformed Humanity. You know, I'm not a big fan of apps because I have probably five pages of apps and I probably use maybe six of them on a regular basis when I feel that when I pick up my phone at a certain place, maybe it should already have an idea of what I want. Or am I asking too much, Marty? Oh, of course you're right. You know, the phone, it basically is a tool. 
It's there to make your life more convenient. Uh, it, it should. It's there to optimize your life. It should understand what you need uh, and provide that service. And of course, with the uh, uh, Apple and Samsung and the others tell you, well, that's fine. We'll solve your problem. All you have to do is download the right apps, which means that you there are two million apps available <laughs> yeah. for each of those phones. Go and pick the right ones for you. That's, and it's just crazy. So uh, the the future that I envision is that every phone will have an artificial intelligence built in it. They're starting already. They've got Siri in the Apple phone. Uh, uh, they've got uh, we've got Alexa. Uh, but the, the amount of intelligence you could put in a phone is increasing astronomically, and this intelligence will be examining your behavior and and figuring out ways to make your life easier. And if it decides that you need something uh, different than other people have, it will either find an app or it will create one for you. So your phone will end up being unique to you. You can just think about it, Kim. Every person in the world is different from every other person. Every person that has ever lived is different from every other person. What is this crazy idea that we're going to make a universal device that does all things for all people? And the bottom line is it doesn't do any of them optimally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to figure out a way to customize any technology if, to make a, that person's, the, that, the owner of that device, uh, to make his life better. That's all the purpose of technology, make people's lives better, not uh, create uh, gadgetry. So do you think, I shouldn't say do you think, when do you think that we will get away and move away from holding this square thing up to our face in order to have a conversation. I mean, I know that we can do it by Bluetooth now with a headset, but will there be a time when there'll be a new form of that technology? Absolutely. Uh, we're only just starting now, but the, uh, the whole idea of calling this gadget, which by the way, I am doing that. I'm called holding this uh, flat piece of plastic against my round face uh, <laughs> with my elbow up in the air in this uh, awkward position. Uh, the idea of, of calling this marvel of technology a phone is kind of crazy because you know what an optimum phone would look like. An optimum phone would be, in your case, you might have it at an earring. Uh, ultimately, uh, that uh, what we call a phone might be embedded under the skin uh, next to your ear, and it would contain a computer. Uh, and if you wanted to talk to somebody, you would say, uh, computer, call Kim. And the computer will say, do you want the Kim uh, in Arizona or your friend in New York? You say, give me the Arizona Kim. And next thing you know, I'm talking to you. To me, uh, that's an almost optimum phone. The really optimum phone, if you think about it, is all I have to do is think. Get Kim on a phone, and there I am talking to you. Well, that, that may take a few, a century or two, but these things are going to happen ultimately. So uh, what we're going to find out is that the phone is going to be distributed over your body. You're, you may carry a gadget on your belt in your purse that is your connection to the outside world, but the details will be done by specific specialized devices. So as an example, if you happen to be, uh, your genetics say that you are subject to congestive heart failure, you may wear a little patch that you stick on your body uh, every month or so, uh, and this thing will sense whether fluid is building up in your lungs, which is the symptom of, of, of getting a, a heart attack, Mm -hmm. uh, and warn you before you get a heart attack. And and you have now eliminated heart attacks uh, from uh, people that uh, that have this thing that we call a cell phone. And so uh, uh, there are many, many ways of sensing what's going around, uh, uh, maybe going around in your body. And if you think about it, what we call disease today 
it really uh, is just uh, baddies in your body, bad bacteria, viruses. Uh, they are there all the time, but your immune system keeps these things under control. Uh, when they get out of control is what we call disease. If we had ways of sensing those things with patches like I talked about, and then we could have the potential of having no disease. Could you imagine that? That would be that would be amazing. That would be phenomenal. I mean to be able to to have predictive technology and to have it based on data and collection of this data. And there's a I think it was Amazon who recently just got a patent on they say a device that you can put in the room and it would detect if you were having heart issues by how you were breathing across the room and they and it's it's not just a patent or or it, they actually have a proof of the concept um it's phenomenal these times that we're living in and my mother is um 82, and she lives in my guest house, and she has for it's not that's nothing new. She's lived in my guest house for twenty odd years, and she's now that she's getting older. I I wanted her to wear one of those things, like you know, help I fall and I can't get up. Okay, she's like, no, I'm not wearing that. <laughs> okay, I'm like, all right. So she's like, why would I need that? I have my phone. So anyway, I went looking around. And with the Amazon Echo Show, which I gave her one and I gave one to every, all of my siblings as well, she can say, Alexa, drop in on Kim, and then my video screen will just turn on and she'll be right there. And I can say, drop in on mom. And she, the screen turns on. But the thing that I love about it, she can just say, Alexa, call for help. So we're kind of getting to a point where – we can, I, I see like there's going to be this next monumental shift because I don't know what you think with technology, Marty, but it seems like we have something and then it, it kind of stays stagnant for a little bit. We have little advancements and then all of a sudden it's like, boom, here comes the next big thing. Yeah, well, uh, there are lots of potential things. There are also some problems. Uh, and the biggest problem is that the people don't adopt these new te technologies all that quickly. You have to do it gradually. Uh, people learn uh, by playing games. And, and to me, uh, things like Facebook and Twitter are, are some of those games. Uh, and after a while, we, we become comfortable with these new technologies, and we move on to the next step. So I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. Of course, most of your listeners don't know what a record is. <laughs> but... Uh, but but uh, it does it does take time to adopt uh, uh, new new technology because technology is not the gadget it's the people yes. and people tend to be conservative they they, they uh, get into habits and giving them new habits takes time and I think that's a good thing because if you go too fast uh, things get out of control and we are in some ways, out of control today. When you talked about this uh, device listening to your breathing, it's listening to everything else. Yes. So uh, what yes. happens to your, your yes. privacy? You know, you get into an argument uh, with with your uh, your husband, and all of a sudden uh, the whole world is listening in on you. So we've got some really serious social problems that we have to solve before we adopt all these uh, wonderful new technologies. And you know what? You bring up a really interesting point because i got to tell you the story. So I've written for USA Today for 17 years. And probably, like, I think I am, like, their longest tech columnist you know, ever, so to speak. And invariably, I will write about Amazon Alexa. And I'll say, Marty, that um, Alexa's always listening. And then... I will typically, probably nine times out of ten, I will hear from the PR department at Amazon, and they'll say, we uh, we would really like you to have a correction because uh, Alexa is not listening all the time. You, we would like you to say Alexa is only listening for the wake word. So as I tell them, how is Alexa 
only listening for the wake word, so she has to be listening all the time, right? <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so what do you think of, and I know it's a really big topic, I mean, but what do you think of all the tracking that the carriers are doing right now and all these different data points that they're having on us? Uh, I think it's, it's intrusive. Uh, it, it's uh, unfair. Uh, it's uh, economically wrong. They're, they're, they are taking information that has great value, and they're taking it for nothing, and then they give us some uh, app in return that is a, has a fraction of the value of what they're taking. Somewhere or other, uh, this is a problem we just have to face, that we are entitled to be in control of our own information. And, and I, I don't blame these companies. I blame the people. They're letting it happen. They think they, that they're getting free searching from Google. Mm-hmm. Well, you know that's not true. Right. And they're, they're getting free delivery from Amazon. That's not true. There these uh, these uh, big companies are providing some excellent services, but we should understand that we should pay for those services, and they should pay us for the information that that they get from us. So uh, we've got things backwards now, and somehow we have to figure out how to how to fix that. And there are people uh, working on that. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, my wife, who uh, uh, you may have heard of, her name is uh, Arlene Harris, and she's been called the first lady of wireless, and she has started an organization that uh, is intended to measure how much privacy companies are providing so that we can measure them. So there could be a a standard, like a a good housekeeping standard of whether companies are protecting your privacy or not. But one way or another, uh, we have to address that uh, problem or the whole concept of privacy is going to disappear, uh, and that's not a very uh, good thing for society. No, you know, it, I'd love to speak to your wife about that too. By the way, that you know, I've I've always told my audience, anytime you get something free, you're the product. Okay. So they're going to figure out how to make money off of you some way, somehow. I mean, Facebook didn't – they don't get billions of dollars a year because you're putting memes up on the site, okay? I mean, that's just ridiculous uh, to think that. But, you know, there are some people who say that privacy is gone forever. I, I, I would like to think that's not true. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with, uh, you know, Google Nest Hub and the Amazon Echo uh, and, of course, with Siri. She still doesn't understand half of what I say, but that's a whole other topic that they just can't figure that out. Um, well, as I mentioned before, it's going to happen. Uh, first of all, it's, it's not going to happen in our generation. Uh, uh, the whole, uh, and I only mention that because I have been suggesting that for many years, uh, and people uh, somehow or other uh, rebel against the idea of having an implant, although if you uh, have a heart problem, you don't uh, 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 complain about that. But I think it's going to start gradually, and the most obvious place is with the phone part. Uh, you know, there there are some people that don't use the phone very much anymore. Uh, but I don't. I think the phone talking to somebody is going to continue to be important uh, forever, uh, and it's so easy to do to take some device and and uh, as I mentioned, uh, putting it in an earring is possible today. And putting it in an implant, you know, the, the biggest problem, Kim, uh, of all these devices is the battery. Yes. Well, think true. about what the what what the human body is. It's nothing but a battery. You ingest food, and your body turns it into energy. And and uh, using a little bit of that energy to run a, f- a phone that's uh, uh, that is implant implanted under your skin, and it makes a great deal of sense. So you won't ever have to charge this phone and be able to talk to anybody uh, anywhere. And and that uh, ultimately uh, is going to move to every other aspect of the phone. And uh, if you uh, ever get to the last chapter of my book, uh, my prediction is that 
And many, many, many generations from now, uh, you won't be able to discriminate between the person and this artificial intelligence. And, and generations beyond then, uh, we're going to worry a little bit about the fact that the artificial intelligence will decide that it can hear better, see better, remember better, and think better than we can, and it may decide that it doesn't need us anymore. But you don't have to worry about that for at least a thousand years. Yeah, gonna, yeah. It's not going to happen this week. Um, it's going yeah, to be way, way into the future. But, uh, yeah, I... Uh, I, I share that thought with you, Marty. I do. Uh, the book's called Cutting the Cord, The Cell Phone Has Transformed Humanity. Uh, it's available everywhere, Marty? Yeah, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, audiobooks, so, uh, Kindle, uh, anywhere. Anywhere you can find it. <laughs> Marty, thank you so much for joining us. Love you, love, you, love your stories. You're a wonderful interviewer. I really, really enjoyed that. You, I was, I was sincere. You, you, uh, you did uh, inspire me, and and I said a few things uh, differently than I ever have before. And, and for us old guys, that's uh, that's a thrill. Okay, nice good. to meet you, Kim. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Don't you just love Marty Cooper? I mean, the guy's ninety-three years old, sharp as a tack. I want to be him someday. So let's all give a big thank you to Marty Cooper for coming on and sharing his stories with us. And I want to leave you with some helpful tips. Like, for example, when's the last time you actually looked at your phone bill and thought, wow, this is so low? Yeah, right. That never happens. So here are a few quick tips for cutting down that monthly cost. Make sure that your service address is up to date. You see, every month your bill comes with extra fees depending upon where you live. Certain states take a bigger chunk out of your bank account, so you could save up to $100 just by updating your info. Okay, next up, auto pay. Many cell carriers let you save around 5 or 10 bucks a month. They want you to sign up for the option, so take advantage of it. Third on our list, make sure you're using the best plan for your needs. Look over how much data that you're actually using. Do you go over the limit? If so, you might be hit with some extra fees, or maybe you're actually paying for more data than you use. So you want to shop around a bit, make sure that you're really getting the best bang for your buck. And don't forget the T-Mobile. They have that over 55 plan. Definitely something that you want to check out. While you're looking at your bill, check for any hidden fees. If you're outside the United States calling people back here, you may be getting hit with a ton of extra fees. So you have a few options. You can use your computer's Wi-Fi or set your phone up for a plan wherever the road leads. And finally, here's something that we've done with our family. It used to be that mom had her cell phone and Ian has his and Barry has this and then I have my phone. Well, we put everybody all under one plan because after all, teamwork makes the dream work. Or in this case, ha, we save some money. And now it's time for me to ask you to do one thing for me. Wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, TuneIn. I know the list goes on and on. I want you to do one thing. I want you to leave us a great five-star review or just say a few words about how wonderful I am. Please. Okay. If you have to lie, just do it because your reviews and comments put us to the top of the list. All right. Maybe there's another thing I need you to do. There's always a subscribe or follow button. So make sure that you subscribe or follow our podcast wherever you get your podcast because this way you get our podcast delivered to you automatically, even while you're sleeping. And thank you so much for listening. And a big thanks to Mike James, Daniel Howard, and Serena O'Sullivan because they're on my team and they do make my dream work. I'm Kim Commando, America's Digital Pro, thanking you once again.